talk today with Paul Berger of St. Peter's, Missouri. Uh, this is an uh, interview being conducted at the 2015 Ripcord Reunion. The interviewer is James Smither of the Grand Valley State University Veterans History Project. Okay, Paul, can you start us off with some background on yourself, and to begin with, where and when were you born? I was born on Valentine's Day, February 14, 1949. And where was in, that? In uh, Washington, Missouri. Okay, and what part of the state is that in? Uh, it's a town uh, of about 10,000 or 15,000, and it's on the Missouri River about 50 miles west of St. Louis. Okay, and did you grow up there or did you move around? Uh, I moved around. Uh, my dad was in college when I was born, and uh, or soon after I was born, and so we moved to uh, Kirksville, Missouri for part of his college, and then we moved to Columbia, Missouri, where he worked on a master's degree. And he, he didn't get it, but he worked on it for a while. And, uh, okay. What did he do for a living? Uh, he was a teacher. He was a shop teacher for uh, 10 years, and then he went into some other things, drafting and uh, uh, other uh, pursuits. Oh, yeah, he was uh, a community development specialist with the University of Missouri Extension Service. Okay. Uh, now, uh, did you finish high school? Yes, I, I uh, graduated from high school in Mexico, Missouri. And uh, I went to the University of Missouri for about a year and a half. And uh, I had a real good friend of mine got killed in Vietnam. And uh, it kind of, I had a, a draft deferment for college, but I, I just couldn't make myself do it anymore. I wasn't doing very well either, so uh, uh, I left college and then I got drafted in July of 1969. All right. Uh, now, aside from having the friend who got killed over there, did you were you aware very much of what was happening over there or what Vietnam was all about? I was, uh, I would say, completely unaware uh, in my senior year in high school. And um, some friends of mine uh, uh, were were friends with another guy and he lived right across the street from the high school and he had the coolest 57 Chevrolet you ever want to see in your life it was and he used to uh, at the end of the school day he wasn't in school anymore he was graduated but he run up and down the street in front of the high school burning tires and stuff it was very cool and that, that guy got drafted and uh, he went in and this was in the fall and he went into uh, I think Either, he may have been in the Marines, I'm not sure, but anyway, before the end of this, my senior year, he got killed, and uh, that uh, kind of woke me up to the fact that there was, uh, there was a war going on, and I could get drafted, mm -hmm. and uh, I was older than uh, most of the other guys in my high school class, and uh, I uh, was draft eligible, you know, halfway through my senior year, so... Uh, I was actually uh, set to be drafted that uh, summer, and I had to prove that I was uh, in college, mm -hmm. and uh, then I got the deferment. And uh, I started college with uh, two two guys, and one of them uh, uh, decided that he really wasn't interested in going to college anymore, and uh, uh, so he uh, joined the army. Because he wanted to be uh, he wanted to be an MP, and so uh, he he did become an MP. But then he was killed. Like he'd only been in Vietnam like three months or something. Mm -hmm. So uh, that really set it for me. And of course, MPs are not really supposed to be you know on front lines. But in Vietnam, yeah. they didn't always have them. Well, uh, he was killed in a rather unconventional way. He uh, was riding in a jeep. Uh, with a machine gun mount and guarding a uh, at the beginning of a convoy of prisoners, there were truckloads of prisoners, and uh, they hit a bump in the road and he fell out of the jeep and got run over by the truck that was following. Mm -hmm. So it was very sad. I mean, you know, I guess there's no good way to get killed in a war, okay. but you know, yeah, uh, that's a reminder of those, those sorts of things too. It was yeah, a very, too, yeah. it, it seemed like a really a waste. Because he was a really nice guy. All right. So, 
but you're kind of resigned to it and say, okay, I guess it's my turn. Yeah. All right. And, uh, so, so uh, but I, it took a long time for them to get around to drafting me. I thought. I mean, I I left college. I left college in uh, January of 1969. I didn't get drafted until July. Okay. And what did you do in the meantime? I did several odd jobs. Uh, I had a friend of my older brother's, and uh, uh, he and I uh, painted barns, uh, barn roofs specifically, uh, you know, silver paint over mm -hmm. uh, corrugated metal with a rope tied around your waist so you didn't fall off the roof. And uh, What else? I did some other odd jobs too that I can't think of right now, but, uh, you know, just kind of bumming around, not really setting the world on fire or anything. Right. Okay, so where did you have to report for basic training? Uh, I reported to uh, the post office in Festus, Missouri, and then they put us on a bus. We went to St. Louis for uh, induction station, and uh, we took the oath there. Uh, they pulled some guys out to be Marines. Uh, I was lucky enough not to be one of those. I, I think I was lucky. Um, and then uh, they put us on a bus for Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, which was uh, was and is the main training station for the almost the whole entire Midwest, uh, Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, I don't know, Wisconsin, I think, too, or uh, Iowa, Wisconsin, and mm -hmm. so forth. And uh, I was there for nine days, uh, but at the time, Fort Leonard Wood was so packed with trainees, they didn't have enough room for us. Uh, to begin our training there. So they shipped us to, um, after nine days, they shipped us to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, a home at 101st. I guess I should have known mm -hmm. it was an omen or something. <laughs> I don't know, but uh, so I took uh, basic training there and then uh, at the end of, I guess it was uh, end of August, 1st of September, I went to AIT at uh, Let's back up a little bit and fill in a few things. Uh, okay. When did you have your draft physical? Did you do that when you were registering, or did you get the real physical only when you get inducted? Uh, no, I had a draft physical. I had to report to the uh, Mark Building, which is a federal building downtown St. Louis. And uh, that was about a month before I was actually drafted, I think. Okay. And when you went to the physical, uh, sometimes we get stories about people who are trying to find ways to beat the system or anything like that. Uh, or did you see any of that going on? I uh, didn't. It probably was, but I didn't notice it. Okay. I didn't pay any attention. I was, you know, I'm, I'm uh, pretty much an introvert, and uh, not, not. I don't particularly make friends real easily, and uh, so I didn't really. I didn't have anybody there that I knew, so mm -hmm. it was just kind of. Yeah go where they tell you and do what they tell you. you know? But you didn't see anything weird going on no, or anything else uh -huh. like that? Yeah, okay. Uh, and then basic training itself, uh, when you first got in, into Leonard Wood, that's your first kind of introduction, uh, what do they do with you? Well, uh, you know, I've seen movies and stuff about how you, uh, the first thing you do is take you down and give you a haircut and then you stand in line and get your uniforms and all that. Well, none of that happened to us. We were like four days, we were sitting in this uh, room and we were still in our civilian clothes. Every day we were doing formations in civilian clothes. And we were all pretty ripe because it was July in Missouri, for God's sakes, it was hot. <laughs> and uh, no air conditioning, the old World War II barracks, the wooden ones. And um, um, I remember guys washing their underwear and socks and shirts and stuff in uh, in the sink at night and trying and hanging them up on the bedpost so they'd have, you know, clean clothes, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I think on the fourth day we got our haircuts, but uh, they still didn't give us uniforms. And so we were standing in formation all day with no hair. And uh, there were guys like myself who were fair skinned. I had a, a friend of mine from my uh, hometown. We got drafted the same day, and he and I had grown up together. And uh, he was real fair-skinned and freckled too. And uh, he he made a little like sailboat hat out of a paper bag to put on top of his head because he knew he was going to get sunburned if he mm -hmm. didn't. And I did get sunburned, uh, but it wasn't real bad. And then finally, on the, I think on the sixth day, we finally got uniforms. So that was red letter day for us, I guess. 
So you really haven't had the movie style speeches from some sergeant telling you you're in the army and all of this kind of stuff. You're just waiting for something to happen. No, uh, we did. Uh, we did the. We arrived at Fort Leonard Wood at at uh, eleven o'clock at night, I think, after a bus ride in the rain, and uh, we were. We took tests, the battery of tests that they give you, psychological tests mm -hmm. and all those other kind of tests, till like four o'clock in the morning. And then we went to bed and got up about an hour later. And, uh, you know, but the rest of the time was, we were pretty much stuck in the barracks and didn't have anything to do. Uh, I remember uh, uh, Chow was particularly bad because they were in, they were so packed and they were rushing the guys to get in and get out and uh, a lot of guys would be standing outside uh, with their food tray eating their uh, food over the garbage can because the mess hall was full and they were pulling people out and you had to shovel it in as fast as you could or you didn't get anything. And uh, I thought that was pretty stupid, especially when I think about it now, there was a one guy, he was an E2. and. Uh, you know, he he apparently his that was his job was just to scream at people and get them to move out. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, if I'd have known what an E two meant at the time, I would have just given him a finger and yep. not paid any attention. You know. Right. Okay. So you, you go through this, but now they say, okay, we're all going over to, to Fort Campbell. Yeah. Do they put you on buses? Or and, yeah. Actually, they didn't even tell us where we were going. They mm -hmm. said, well, we're, you're going to another place and get on this bus and here's your paper. And he gave us a whole packet of paper and put a young, I think, second lieutenant in charge of us. And we stopped one time to eat a lunch somewhere in southern Illinois or mm -hmm. southern Missouri, somewhere. And uh, it counted us going on, getting off the bus, counted us getting back on. And when we got to uh, Fort Campbell, I don't really remember much about that. I, I just remember, uh, again, we were in old World War II barracks, wooden barracks, two-story barracks. Uh, the fire traps, and uh, I do remember them talking about fire and how uh, these buildings were known to uh, become completely engulfed in flames in less than four minutes or something like some ridiculous amount of time. So they impressed upon us that you know you're not supposed to smoke in here. And I didn't smoke anyway, so it didn't matter to me. But fire guard was something that was pretty important. Okay. So now do you start training pretty quickly now once you're there or what happened? Yes, we started immediately. Uh, we got there on a Saturday. We started on the following Monday. Okay. And what did the basic training actually consist of at that point? Well, it was mostly physical training. You, you do PT every morning and every evening and uh, you march to, march to classes and they give you classes on uh, oh, the military justice system. Uh, M16 rifle or M14 rifle, I guess we train on M14s and uh, other weapons. And uh, but the first couple of weeks was almost all physical training. You march here and march there and run here and run there. And, and uh, all right. And uh, how well did the people hold up under that? Well, about half of uh, my uh, platoon were. Uh, National Guard or reserves, and uh, those guys were, uh, you know, they knew all the rules because they'd been in for a while, and the rest of us draftees, we didn't know come here for the second, so we were just kind of uh, at a loss, I guess. We followed the other guys and did what they did, what they did, and uh, the uh, the guys who had been in the longest were made uh, temporary. NCOs, and uh, but they weren't particularly helpful. Uh, you just kind of learn by osmosis, I guess, or you know by watching somebody. And there was a lot of uh, you know there were there were guys who were overweight. There was a lot of uh, punishment, uh, physical stuff they had to do just to uh, get them. I remember this one kid. Uh, he was very short, like a little fire plug and short and round, and he was kind of a smart mouth. He'd been picked on his whole life, so he wasn't gonna take any crap from anybody. And uh, 
he uh, they were forever making him low crawl everywhere because uh, uh, whenever he do something wrong or he'd get out of step or whatever they make him low crawl and uh, I remember a uh, drill sergeant taking his helmet liner and uh, drop kicking it and having him go low crawl over there to get it and low crawl all the way back and it was <laughs> quite a show but at the end of the at the end of the training he was the best guy low crawler that I ever saw mm -hmm. <laughs> he could really move all right now did most of the people who start the, the training finish it yeah, uh, we had uh, one guy who was sort of a derelict, and uh, he, I don't think he, I don't think he, he made it through, but everybody else did, I believe. All right, and how much emphasis was there on discipline, obeying orders, saluting, that kind of thing? Oh uh, yeah, that was, that was all part of the deal. Uh, our drill sergeant was uh, very young, I think he, uh, he uh, joined the Army when he was 17 and after his advanced training he went to jump school and did uh, parachute training and then he went to drill instructor school or no I take it back he went to NCO school mm -hmm. and when he became a, a sergeant then he went to drill sergeant school so he'd been in the Army for maybe three years and had been doing nothing but training <laughs> and all the other drill sergeants were all Vietnam veterans so they treated him almost as bad as they treated us you know he was like dirt and our platoon could never we never won any of the contests mm -hmm. you know never and uh, our barracks was always the worst one and you know it was just just crap they gave him because he was so green mm -hmm. No, um, did he treat you decently enough, or? Oh, I, he was kind of an ass, but, mm -hmm. you know. Actually, uh, the drill sergeant in the next barracks over uh, was always riding his case and riding our case. But near the end of the training, uh, I was on a detail with that drill sergeant, and it turned out he was just pretty much a regular guy. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I was shocked by some of the stuff he he talked to us as we were like a four man crew doing a some I don't know dinky job I can't remember what it was but uh, he was very down to earth and jovial and and I was so surprised by that but I you know I learned that uh, from that I, I think I learned that they uh, were just doing what they thought they had to do to uh, bring us along so to speak. Okay, now how long did the basic training go? Uh, it was about eight and a half weeks, I guess. Okay. And what did they do with you when that was finished? Well, before I tell you that, uh, I will say that uh, I was, uh, I pulled KP more than any other person in the whole platoon. And the reason that was, was because there was another guy with the same last name. And um, I had never been anywhere where I knew somebody with the same last name. And this guy was six foot seven and uh, a really nice guy. I mean, I got to know him pretty well. We were good friends. But whenever they called his name, I always answered. And he learned to keep his mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> so every time, we, uh, first couple of days, they went down the roster to say mm -hmm. KP. So the first two days I was on KP, I took one for me and one for him. And then they went alphabetically through mm -hmm. the thing. And I was near the beginning of the alphabet. So I got two or three more times. And one of the things I missed was machine gun training. They went to the machine gun range and they learned about the M60 machine gun. I never took that training. Mm -hmm. I did not fire an M60 machine gun until I was in Vietnam. Okay. Uh, which is strange because I ended up being an assistant gunner. So. All right. Now, in the, now in the meantime, though, you do you do basic training and then you have to get advanced individual training somewhere. Yes. Uh, so where did you go for that? Well, uh, we uh, we graduated, I think, on a on a Friday, I guess, and on uh, Saturday they loaded us up, loaded us, loaded us up on buses, and we drove to Fort McClellan, Alabama. Okay, and what kind of training were you getting there? Uh, I was in a uh, five platoon company, and there were four infantry platoons and one mortar platoon, and I was in the mortar platoon. So I I, I did mortar training, uh, uh, but we did advanced uh, infantry training as well. So we got both. 
It just didn't happen to involve the M60 machine gun. Yeah, right. We never, never saw the M60 machine gun there either. Uh, but uh, they did. Uh, we did get training uh, on the uh, M16, which of course is another precursor to or another omen. In mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so. And was the infantry training pretty much geared to Vietnam? Yeah, it, uh, that was what it was supposed to be, but of course it's uh, northern Alabama, or central Alabama, so it didn't look like Vietnam. Uh, they had a lot of, uh, the range was pretty much uh, savanna with a few pine trees, and then they had oak uh, pine forest that we trained in and did, uh, uh, oh, what do you call it? Not a camp out in a bivouac. Bivouac, yeah, sorry. And uh, uh, so that kind of stuff was all pretty much geared to Vietnam, but uh, they had like bamboo uh, buildings that they tried to make look, I guess, like Vietnam, and, and uh, we did some of that. But okay. Did they have Vietnam veterans as part of the group who were training at that point? Uh, yes, and, uh, but our platoon NCOs were all shake and bake, and, uh, E5s and E6s. Uh, so, uh, again, they were, uh, almost as low down as the rest of us, you know, they got yelled at all the time, and they were, you know, pretty much regular guys. Uh, they didn't, they didn't give us too much crap, but they, uh, they got, yell that all the time because the formation wasn't straight or, you know, this and that. Okay. Now, is life any better in AIT than it was in, in BASIC or? Yeah, because uh, in the first place, uh, the barracks were concrete block and uh, so they were much cooler and of course we got there in September mm -hmm. so it started getting cold and uh, toward the end it actually snowed there. They had, nobody had seen snow for years in uh, central Alabama. but. You know, it was nothing to me, but um, uh, but the barracks were much more comfortable because they were uh, single story, so you didn't have to worry about you know guys tromping around on the roof all night trying to keep you awake or whatever. All right, uh, and how long was the AIT? Well, I got there early September, and uh, I went on. I graduated on November fifteenth. Okay. Now, uh, for the mortar training, what size mortars did you train on, or what did you do? Uh, we, we trained on the 81 millimeter uh, standard uh, mortar, and we also had, uh, they, were, they were 81 millimeter mortars, but they had uh, special uh, adapters on them to uh, f air, uh, it's like a air rifle mm -hmm. kind of a thing, where they fired a little pretend mortar round and we use that to uh, train on to get an idea about sighting the mortar on the uh, on the aiming post and uh, adjusting fire one side or the other and just to give you a, a sort of an idea how that worked mm -hmm. and we also did live fire of course but uh, okay did they introduce you to the larger mortars that were no uh, well we uh, we were shown how they work, but we didn't actually fire them ourselves. Right. Okay. Uh, so the expectation is you're going to be with the mortar platoon with the yeah, um, unit. Yeah. Although I, I will say I did get to fire a 50 caliber machine gun at AIT, mm -hmm. and that was, that's the best. I mean, because <laughs> you sit up on top of a hill and there's old APCs and tanks down in this valley, and, and you're shooting at stuff that's a mile and a half away or whatever, and you follow the tracers in. It's very cool. Right. All right. Uh, now, once you, you finish the IT, you've gotten out to beginning of November. Now, what happens to you? Well, I have a thirty-day leave, and uh, uh, I can't remember. I think my parents had moved. No, they hadn't moved. That's right. Uh, my parents had moved to Maryville, Missouri, and. Uh, I had helped with that move before I went in the Army. So I knew where the house was and I, I took a bus from, uh, no, I took a, yeah, I took a bus to Atlanta, Atlanta to St. Louis. 
No, I landed in Kansas City, and my parents picked me up in Kansas mm -hmm. City, which is about uh, 100 miles from Maryville. Right. And did you have orders from Vietnam at this point? Yes, I did. Uh, okay. And uh, I, I actually uh, became an E-2 also, which I thought well, I was really happy about that, although it meant a whole, like, $4 a mm -hmm. month raise or something like that. Now, E-2 is just a, a private, as opposed to a yes. recruit is an E-1, and then a PFC is an E-3. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, now, how did your family feel about the prospect of you going to Vietnam? Well, uh, my parents were rel are, were relatively religious, especially my mother, and I, I knew she was going to be praying every day, you know. But I don't, I don't know, we didn't talk about it much. Uh, uh, I think it's because I don't talk about stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know, with, with my parents, I never did. Real serious stuff. Okay. I don't know. So, get to the end. Now, where do you have to go to ship out? Um, yeah, I, was, I reported to uh, Oakland Army Base. So, I flew into San Francisco and I had uh, about uh, 20 hours or so before I actually had to report. So, Myself and another guy from Kansas City, uh, we met up in uh, San Francisco. We went bar hopping uh, to uh, nudie bars and stuff, drinking champagne with girls and stuff. Mm -hmm. It was weird, but you know, I ended up uh, back at the airport at the USO, and then uh, the next morning uh, they uh, flew us by helicopter from uh, San Francisco Airport to Oakland Airport, and then we took a bus to uh, Oakland Army Base. And we were there, I don't know, about a day and a half, I think. And from there we went to uh, Travis Air Force Base by bus. And uh, uh, we were waiting in the uh, uh, building for, uh, for the flight to be called, and, uh, some female uh, naval officer went by or two, and somebody said something to him, and uh, immediately we were taken out of the room <laughs> and put under an awning outside, uh, and it was cold and raining, and uh, you know, we were all standing there underneath this awning for about an hour and a half before the play was ready. And uh, then we got on, and I think it was Flying Tiger Airline, Flew, uh, flew to Hawaii. That was the first and only time I've been to Hawaii. I was there for 45 minutes, mm -hmm. about eight o'clock at night. It was wonderful. It was breezy and 85 degrees. So you get to, you got to get off the plane at least. Yes, we got off the plane. And, uh, and uh, honestly, I don't remember where. We, I think we flew to uh, Guam from there, but I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. All I, and we flew into Thompson Hood Air Base. Okay. About what time of day did you get to Vietnam? Uh, it was about 11 o'clock or 10 o'clock in the morning, something like that. Okay. And what's your first impression of Vietnam when you get there? Well, you open up the door and it's like uh, the worst day and worst humidity I've ever felt. Well, it's actually kind of like being in St. Louis in August. Mm -hmm. on a, but anyway, it was really bad. It blasted you. And it was about 95 degrees probably. And we walked off the plane in the, you know, double file. And uh, walked by all these guys dressed in in uh, dirty fatigues and boonie hats, and they were all yelling at us and stuff. <laughs> and it was kind of funny, but. Uh, and then what do they do with you once you're off the plane? Uh, they put us on buses, and uh, the buses all had uh, screen wire over the windows so that uh, they couldn't throw grenades in. And then we went to Benoit. And I had my orders, and all it said was uh, APO San Francisco 96383. So you don't, you have no idea what that means. Mm -hmm. And uh, but they had a map of Vietnam on the bulletin board, and it showed you where all these APOs were. And that's when I knew I was going to the 101st. Mm -hmm. And I felt kind of proud of that, but uh, really wondering too, did they, you know, expect me to do parachute jumps because I didn't have training and. I really wasn't into that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm afraid of heights. Uh, so, but uh, we were at Benoit, I think, for uh, maybe a day and a half, 
And we loaded, then we, we took a bus over, back over to Tonsonute, and uh, they put us on a C-130 with, uh, you know, I, I prayed for one of those web seats, you know, but it was just cargo uh, flats. They are on uh, coaster, or like uh, a little uh, wheels, and mm -hmm. uh, they're flat on the ground, flat on the bed of the plane, and you sit uh, all together, and they put one strap across you, and that's you know supposed to be safe. Mm -hmm. And we flew like that with, you know, your back was killing you by the time we got to wherever. I think we made a stop because we changed planes. We made a stop in Da Nang, yeah. I'm, I'm guessing. Or maybe it was Cameron Bay, I don't know. But anyway, somewhere up in the middle of the country we made a stop and we changed planes to a C-123 and that was the same thing. We were on cargo and mm -hmm. things. And flew into uh, Fubai. And then uh, I don't remember how I got from Fubai to uh, Camp Evans for the search training, uh, Screaming Eagle Replacement Training Center. Mm -hmm. Usually it was truck, sometimes it's helicopters. But... Yeah, I, I think it was truck, but I, I'm really not sure. All right. Uh, so the, this Screaming Eagle Replacement Training, what, what was that? Well, uh, once again, uh, I, uh, I got there on December 7th, or uh, December, maybe it was like the 20th or the 21st. So they didn't want to start our training because Christmas holiday was mm -hmm. going to be in there. So we just hung around the barracks for a couple of days and uh, I pulled KP two or three more times. I'm telling you, I had the worst luck when I gave <laughs> KP. And, uh, but the KP there was was good because you only worked a half a day. So if you started off in the morning, you were done at noon, and and then we just kind of hung around the barracks, and uh, we weren't allowed to go anywhere. But there was really nowhere to go anyway. Mm -hmm. And nighttime, uh, they uh, they had bunkers right behind us. The bunker line was right behind us, and uh, you could see guys shooting their weapons off all night long, and and. Uh, Firing uh, grenade launchers, I think, and all that kind of stuff. I think they just did it to uh, harass us, but you know, I kind of got used to it. And now, as you were kind of making the rounds here at the beginning of your time in Vietnam, uh, did any of these bases take any incoming fire, rockets, no. or mortars, things like that? Uh, Camp Evans had not been mortared for, uh, I think, 18 months or so when I got there. And uh, later on, uh, it, during my tour, probably five months later, we got a rocket that was right up the road from us, and the the gravel from the it landed on the road, and the gravel from the road hit the top of the roof of my the hooch I was in. So it was a little frightening, but uh, that was uh, the first time they'd been mortared in 18 months or so mm -hmm. during that. But anyway, that's about way ahead. Okay. So yeah. now so, you, you kind of so what was Christmas in Vietnam like? Uh, well, the food was pretty good, um, and you know I did half a day's KP, and then uh, you know I was just kind of bored really, and uh, they didn't issue us weapons or anything, so we were totally. Although I I think we did pull uh, guard, and I don't remember how that worked, but I think we we had to pull guard on the bunker line. But, uh, I mean, it's kind of crazy putting brand new guys on the bunker mm -hmm. line, you know. So maybe we didn't. I, I really don't remember. But, no, uh, it's quite possible you did. But yeah. anyway, uh, so now finally, did they wait till after New Year's to start your training, or did you just no, start after Christmas? No, uh, right after Christmas, I think on the 26th, we started training. And um, which uh, uh, meant we went up and did weapons training, first of all. And... Uh, uh, that's when I got to fire the M60 machine gun, and uh, we fired laws, rockets, we fired uh, uh, recoilless rifles, and uh, so grenade launchers. Grenade launchers, and we did uh, 
we did uh, grenade training too, which was kind of weird. What was weird about grenade training? Well, you know, in basic and uh, advanced training, you do grenade training and you stand on a concrete pillar uh, so that in case you accidentally drop it, you can kick it underneath the pillar and hunker down and you'll be relatively safe from the blast and the drill sergeant can be in there with you because they stayed right there. Uh, uh, and uh, here we were just throwing them across the this open ground we were at and, and ducking, you know. <laughs> so uh, it was a lot less imposing, I guess, mm -hmm. if you will, uh, than it had been in training. And uh, anyway, um, we also did, uh, they had a, uh, an NVA uh, guy who had um, turned himself in and he showed us how they crawl through the uh, barbed wire around stuff. And uh, it was very sobering, you know. And did you do uh, some kind of practice patrol or something like that as part no. of this? No, oh, we didn't do that. Okay. Uh, and about how many days was this school? Well, I remember I pulled KP on New Year's Day, so <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I'm pretty sure that the training was supposed to be two weeks. So I think we, we did like four or five days between Christmas and New Year's, and then maybe ten days after that. And um, uh, then we graduated from that, and we were uh, sent to our units. Well, I, I, my unit was second to 506, and so it was in uh, Camp Evans. But some guy told me, I told him where I was supposed to go, and he told me to get on that truck. And so I got on that truck, and it went south to Camp Sally. And, of course, I knew there was something wrong, but I, I, there's no way you can talk to the driver or, you know. And so we rolled down Highway 1 to Camp Sally, and uh, that was kind of an experience. Uh, I remember... Well, I'm not sure if it was then or some other time, but there were uh, uh, South Vietnamese soldiers firing AK-47s alongside the road, and uh, I don't know what they were doing, but it, you know, we were taught to, uh, during the training, they, they fired AK-47s, and I think they fired AK-47s in AIT, just so we'd know what they sounded like. So that was kind of frightening, because we were all unarmed, we were just mm -hmm. had duffel bags. Anyway, I got to Camp Sally, and I reported at uh, some headquarters, and I don't remember where I was, but they told me, they looked at my orders and go, well, what are you doing here? You know, you're supposed to be up there. I said, I know, but they told me to get on this truck, and I got on this truck, and the guy said, oh, okay, well, there's barracks over there, grab a bunk, uh, take the night off, get some sleep, and come back see me in the morning, we'll get you situated. So the next morning, I got on a truck, and it drove me up to back up to Evans and down to camp, uh, or down to 2nd of 506, and, uh, and I went to, uh, I went to Alpha Company and introduced myself, and, and uh, that was that. I, all right. Uh, and so when do you actually join Alpha Company then? Is this mid-January now, or? Yeah, it had to be around the 12th to the 15th, something like that. I'm not really sure. And was the company just in the camp at that point and all no, there? they were in the field. field. Okay. Yeah, and I—I uh, um, I think they put me in a barracks, and uh, Sergeant Thomas was the company clerk, and uh, he sort of got me situated. And then uh, they, at that time, um, there was a supply sergeant, and each company had their own supply room. So I had to go get outfitted, and I went to uh, the uh, supply room, and uh, I can't remember the sergeant's name, but anyway, he uh, gave me a, a rucksack and uh, claymores and magazines and uh, uh, bayonet and all the accoutrement that you need. Uh, 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 I don't know. I don't think he gave me grenades, but. Uh, just about everything else, and uh, and I was issued a rifle, and uh, at that time they let you keep your rifle with you. Uh, uh, so 
uh, and then the next morning, uh, the next morning I had KP in the battalion again, and uh, uh, I think it was, I'm going to say three days or so before the company came in. Okay, so they didn't fly you out to join them or anything like that? The company came in and uh, they had a two or three day stand down and I joined their company then. Okay, and when you met them, what kind of reception did you get? Uh, well, I was pretty much the lower than whale shit, you know, just new guy and uh, the platoon leader, uh, Lieutenant Joliet, assigned me to uh, be the assistant gunner on the machine gun, which I had no clue as to how to use, but anyway. And uh, my machine gunner was Bobby Young, and, and he, uh, he called me Cherry from the day we met until the day I left the field. He, <laughs> even after that, he called me Cherry. And, uh, but uh, most of the guys were a little, uh, I don't know, a little standoffish maybe, but, you know, they weren't too bad, and uh, they, sh they showed me stuff how to, how to rig a poncho liner so you didn't get wet, and uh, how to, uh, you know, how to how to, how to rig your rucksack so it didn't kill you, uh, which is very important. Uh, did it kill you just in terms of just how the weight was distributed, or with things blowing up? Yeah, um, a little bit of that, but uh, mostly I learned that from from doing, you know, where to put the weight, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, the most the heaviest thing you carry is water, and uh, so you learn pretty quick to. Uh, to distribute the weight so that it's up on your shoulders more and uh, on your shoulders and your hips. And uh, they developed a brand new type of uh, rucksack that had a, what they call an interior frame. And the frame was actually sewn into the uh, uh, rucksack, but the, uh, they were relatively worthless. They were really bad and they'd kill you. So the old uh, aluminum frame uh, exterior frame uh, rucksacks. Uh, the platoon sergeant, I mean the uh, supply sergeant. Supply sergeant. Uh, first, he gave me one of the new ones, and then uh, he was talking to somebody else. And then he goes, "Oh yeah, you know, I got this frame over here." And he goes, "Here, you you'll want to use this. Take this with you. This, trust me, you'll want this." And, and I said, "Okay." And he was absolutely right. <laughs> and then. Um, you take a uh, C ration box of cardboard and put it on uh, the interior of the uh, rucksack so that it uh, that's what's on your back, what's what's on your back. And then at night when you're ready to go to bed or ready to go to sleep, you can take that cardboard out and lay it on the ground and it evens out the ground a little bit. Okay. Now how soon did you go out in the field? Well, uh, what happened was uh, the company uh, was given refresher training. So all that training I had just done in CERTS, I redid it all again. <laughs> and uh, only I had a couple extra things. One of them was crossing a stream with uh, using a rope, uh, like to do you know, hand over hand. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was pretty interesting, although I never got to use it. And uh, we also did rappelling, which we hadn't done in CERTS. And uh, that, uh, for somebody who's afraid of heights, this is the scariest thing you can imagine. But I did it, and uh, uh, we had to do the tower first, and then we had to actually go up in a chopper and rappel from a chopper. And that was absolutely mind-blowingly uh, frightening to me. But I, I ended up doing that, too, so it was kind of And then cool. did you ever actually do that in the field? No. Uh, thank God. Do you remember who your company commander was at that point? Uh, company commander at that time was uh, Captain Folletter. And uh, his first name was Vincent. And uh, the reason I remember that is because we the dog was named Vincent. We had a company dog. Mm -hmm. and, and it was a female, but they named him Vincent. And named her Vincent anyway. And, uh, she kind of roamed around. And, mm -hmm. Now, did he stay with you long, or did he rotate out? He uh, was... I think he rotated out during that stand down. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were there for about six days and then we went to Firebase Jack on foot 
we walked from Camp Evans to Jack, which is about six miles. And uh, I don't know, but I, I'm pretty sure that uh, he was still with us on Jack, but then when we got to Jack, they changed to Captain Burkhart. Mm -hmm. and, All right. Now, once you were at Jack, what kind of assignments did you have? Well, uh, Jack was just being built at the time, and it was it was pretty much done. But there were uh, little things that had to be done, like they had firing positions, but they wanted to co uh, cover the firing the top of the covering top of the firing position with uh, a culvert half. It's like a uh, corrugated metal dome, and then you cover that with two or three layers of sandbags, so for overhead cover. Uh, so we were doing that, uh, filling sandbags, that kind of thing, and uh, we were also burying food gas, which is uh, jelly gasoline, it's pretty much like napalm, and you bury it in the ground about halfway, and then you then you put explosives underneath it and uh, uh, white phosphorus grenades, and then when you blow the the explosive it sprays that jelly gasoline in an arc and you put it just inside the wire so if if you're attacked and they're in the wire you kind of burn them to a crisp. Mm -hmm. All right, and, so about how long did you spend doing that kind of work do you think? Oh uh, we were in Jack about well, I want to say two weeks. Mm -hmm. So it would have been right at the first of February. And then we uh, we did my first combat assault by helicopter. Uh, we flew into the flats, uh, which was really strange, but uh, because the rest of the whole time the, the unit was in the mountains, but we were in the flats uh, north of Jack. This is kind of close to the coast. Well, it's probably about ten miles from the coast. Okay. But um, the uh, t t terrain is kind of rolling sandy hills, and uh, so we uh, they flew us to this little knob, and the, the pilot landed on the knob, but uh, he landed uh, with one skid, and it was relatively level, but the other skid was just like mm -hmm. in the air. So uh, when, we, when we jumped out, uh, I was in the middle of a of a five-man group. We had two on each side of me and I was in the middle. And maybe one other guy was in the middle too, I don't remember. But I think it was just five of us. So when I jumped off, I twisted my left knee and uh, it hasn't been the same since. I, <laughs> I always blame it on that anyway, I don't mm -hmm. know. But you know how you land and your knee goes one way and the rest of you goes the right. other. And because uh, I had a hundred pounds or 85 pounds, whatever, on my back, and uh, and then we we walked a short distance, and we uh, the three platoons were set up in three different places, and uh, one platoon got hit, and a guy got killed. Uh, probably uh, Viet Cong, the only time we were ever in an area where there would have been Viet Cong, mm -hmm. and uh, so that was very sobering. Uh, I think it was white knuckle time for me that night. But anyway, we we went, uh, we walked, I don't know, a click or two. It wasn't too bad, you know, walking on the flat ground. It was kind of nice, you know. Little did I know that that was the first and last time I'd ever be doing that. Anyway, we, uh, we set up a night defensive position on this little hill, and it was literally uh, 15 feet higher than the, the area around it. But it, and that night we, uh, uh, they were calling in artillery first. Uh, the lieutenant was calling in artillery and they had a whole battery short and it landed, it was supposed to go over our heads and out ahead of us, but it landed about uh, 15 feet or so from the base of the hill we were on. And uh, so that was the first time that uh, that had ever happened to anybody, and they were all, everybody was scared. But they called in a ceasefire, and we didn't, that was it. But we could have all been killed mm -hmm. very easily. 
So I, I never trusted artillery <coughs> after that. I mean, I've got friends here that are in artillery, but geez, I mean, you know, that was bad. <laughs> Scared the hell out of all of us. Okay, and how long did this patrol or whatever last? Well, uh, I think the next day we were still sitting on this little hill and the uh, colonel flew over and he, he saw that we had, uh, you know, we rigged our uh, poncho liners up through the little <coughs> scrub brush there just to be in the shade. And he saw that and went ballistic over the radio and had the lieutenant move us out. And so we moved out and I don't think we went more than half a click and then they... Uh, loaded us up on choppers again and we flew into the mountains and said goodbye to the flats forever. All right. Uh, now once you go in the mountains, this is still, this is February, this is, yeah, the weather is still not too good, February. is it? Well, um, the weather is just starting to break in, uh, in the mountains, but every night the fog moved in. And, uh, sounds like a machine gun. <laughs> uh, every night the fog moved in and if you were on top of a hill and you woke up the next day it was some of the most beautiful sight you'd ever see you'd see these jungle encrusted hills poking up out of the fog and the valleys would just be totally fogged in and it was really interesting and beautiful I, I was really taken by the beauty of the whole thing but uh, and were you just kind of patrolling around looking for things or yeah well We, uh, you know, I don't remember a whole lot about it, uh, but we, we would move occasionally in one direction and generally work our way back to the same place and then go to another spot. And uh, uh, I remember uh, one area that was wide open and that was really strange because there was no there was no jungle there, but it wasn't because it was uh, uh, blown away or anything. I think it was because it was just a rock right next to the surface <laughs> of the soil, and uh, there were artillery shell holes around and stuff. But and uh, I uh, I. I think I was pretty high strung at the time. I was wound up pretty tight because I I was just afraid all the time. And and then when you're not, you know I wasn't used to being with the guys yet, and they still were treating me like, you know, you know go away. You're too new. You know that kind of thing. And uh, so I was uh, I was pulling guard, and I wasn't having any trouble staying awake on guard, which was kind of unusual. And one night. Uh, when we were on this place where there were no trees, uh, we set up an NDP and uh, I fell asleep and I was having a dream and I was dreaming that there was a uh, resupply helicopter coming in and my sergeant told me to go over there and help him unload and I got up out of my uh, where I was sleeping and walked out of the perimeter. And uh, it's a very scary thing when you do that and you wake up and you're walking along. And I did, I woke up and it was pitch black and I was walking along and I fell in a, one of those mortar or <laughs> shell holes. And I looked up and uh, I had no idea where I was. I, I was totally disoriented, but there was a Claymore mine sitting right on that shell thing. Uh, I didn't see it at that time, but uh, the uh, platoon leader, uh, Lieutenant Joe, had popped a flare or had somebody pop a flare because I was missing and uh, they didn't know about it for about a, probably half hour, 45 minutes, and then it was my turn to run to be on guard and uh, they couldn't find me. So, uh, you know, I walked back uh, with my hands up and, and uh, uh, they called in artillery flares. And the whole place lit up, and that's when I saw the, that's what it was, that's when mm -hmm. I saw the Claymore. So all somebody had to do was hit that thing, and it would have blown me to bazillion pieces. Uh, but anyway, I, I got back in, and I, uh, uh, this uh, a platoon sergeant had been on guard, and I think he fell asleep because he didn't see me leave, and he should have seen me leave. 
because it was dark, but it mm -hmm. wasn't that dark, you know what I mean? And, uh, uh, but he was a veteran of Hamburger Hill, the last one in the company, I think. And uh, so he didn't get in trouble or anything. And, but uh, I, I'm pretty sure that later on uh, that benefited me, and I'll tell you about that later. Okay. But uh, So at that point, was it sort of normal for people to fall asleep when they're supposed to be awake? or Well... The guys, uh, you know, that was the era of the uh, pocket transistor radios, and uh, guys that had those, they'd buy them at the PX, or they'd have somebody in the world send them one, and they'd put an earphone in, and they'd be listening to, you know, uh, the rock radio all night. I never did that because uh, my eyesight's never been that good, and I thought, well, if, if uh, you know, if we're going to get attacked at night and I'm on guard, I'm going to have to be listening. Because I, uh, I used to squirrel hunt, and that's the only way I'd ever uh, get a squirrel was I'd hear him. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, even if it was raining, you can hear a squirrel shake a, a tree limb, and it sounds different than just the regular rain falling. So I learned, I think my hearing was pretty sharp. Anyway, that's the way I felt. I don't know if it really is or not. But, All right. Uh, so uh, I never did any of that. I... Uh, I'd always have to borrow a watch because uh, you don't know this at the time, but it's always good to have a watch with a luminous dial so you can tell what time it is because otherwise, you, how do you know when your time is up? So you'd always mm -hmm. have to borrow a watch from somebody or something. And, uh, that first month or so, kind of February and the beginning of March, was there much enemy activity where you're patrolling or was it no, quiet? Uh, we would sometimes find uh, old bunkers and stuff. Um, but usually, uh, we weren't seeing anybody, okay. you know, and that was good. Because we were, we were in the general vicinity of Ripcord, not real close to it or nothing, but, uh, we weren't too far away. Okay, and then, uh, in March, um, yeah. on the 12th of March, they make the first attempt to establish a fire base that will be Ripcord, yeah. that they want to use as a launching pad to go further around. Uh, your company is involved in that. So were you, were you with them that day, and, and what happened? Yeah, we were... Well, bef before all that happened, uh, there was a long-range recon patrol, and they were, in, uh, they were in close proximity to us. We were on the side of this mountain. And this mountain, I don't know where it was. Uh, I've seen some of the figures where... Might have been, but it didn't look right to me. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, and we had uh, we'd had contact. Uh, and, um, the, the matter of fact, that was the only time I think I'd been in contact before Rickport. We uh, were on patrol. The whole platoon was on. Or something, no, I guess I, uh, probably. Uh, one squad was on patrol, but the lieutenant was with us and RTO was with us. And we were going up this uh, trail and the uh, the guy who was walking point was named Al Deneffi. And uh, the guy walking slack was uh, named Bozek. Bozek was from Iowa and Deneffi I think was from Minnesota. Anyway, uh, he saw something in the trail and Deneffi did and he turned to say something to Bosek about it and it exploded and it it uh, literally shredded the back of his leg it actually hit both legs but one leg was really bad in it and it looked like hamburger and I don't know what happened to him I mean I know he went back home but I don't know if he lost his leg or not but and anyway we we rigged up uh, uh, a way to carry him down and uh, I mean we had a short firefight there but they didn't hang around they they took off and so we had to tr take him about 400 meters to the LZ to get him out to get both of them out both that got hit on the thumb and it almost tore his thumb off it was just kind of hanging by a shred and uh, we carried, uh, we got them back to uh, 
to the NDP, I think, and then they did a jungle penetrator to get him out. And uh, right after that, uh, this long range patrol ran into uh, North Vietnamese. And what they were supposed to do when they ran into the enemy was get out of there, not get in a firefight, just leave. So these six guys are in this patrol, or maybe seven, I don't know, and most of them go one way and one guy goes the other off the trail. And the six guys, they all got back together, but the one guy, he was out there by himself. And so uh, they were part of uh, Echo Company and the Echo Company commander got uh, a PSYOPs helicopter and was circling the area where they knew he was. And they knew he was hiding because there had been no rifle fire or anything. So he was pretty sure he was, he was okay, but he was out there by himself. And uh, he was lost for about uh, a day and a half or anyway, overnight he was lost. And he, he said he could hear him moving around, but he didn't want to move himself because he was afraid he'd run right into him. Anyway, uh, so the other guys came back to, to our, ND, our NDP and then together we got a group together and went out to find the other guy. And in the meantime, the, the lieutenant's flying over with the helicopter and he's using his mirror to tell him where he is. And in the meantime, he's on the microphone telling him what to do and mm -hmm. so forth. So we ended up picking that guy up and uh, he was a fair-skinned guy too, but he was white as a sheet. He was really afraid, and I, you know, can't blame him a bit. Right. But when oh. at this point, this tape is about up, so we are going to pause. Sorry. Okay, so we've taken your story now into March of, of 1970, uh, and this is the time when the whole larger report operation gets started. So um, basically, kind of pick up there. Um, what do you wind up doing and, and when does it start for you? Well, so <clears throat> we, um, we found this guy who had been lost and we got him back and uh, they were going to put him on a helicopter to get him out of, the, out of there and uh, so we left two people to guard uh, the rucksacks at this place we had been and the rest of us went down to secure the LZ and the LZ came in and picked up the guy and we started to walk back up to where we'd left the two guys and we hear rifle fire coming from there. So we hurried up and came back up and uh, one of the guys was a medic and he said that he was sitting there and he heard a noise and he turned around and looked up the trail and there was a North Vietnamese guy rooting through one of the rucksacks that was sitting right there by a tree or something. And he shot him, or he thought he shot him, and, uh, but he didn't know, you know what else was going on. He stayed where he was because he was you know, afraid to go up and, you know, because he might have three or four other buddies. So uh, we got back there and my sergeant at the time, Sergeant Lopez, uh, there was a big tree and the trail went around the tree and he stepped around the trail and the uh, North Vietnamese soldier was laying there. He was wounded but he wasn't dead and he shot him two or three more times, killed him. And uh, so this was the first time I, did, I would have an opportunity to, to see a North Vietnamese soldier. So we all had a look, you know, and uh, we uh, Bobby Young, who was my machine gunner, and I, we both looked and then we got around to the back of the tree and all of a sudden his buddy, who was up a little rise, fired an RPG at us. And it hit that tree. If it hadn't hit that tree, I wouldn't be here talking to you because it would have hit both Bobby and me and we'd both be dead. But uh, uh, I think Bobby Young was probably the most ferocious fighter I ever knew. He didn't, he didn't waste a second. He went around the side of that tree with a machine gun and 
just blasted the hill all 50 rounds. And uh, meanwhile, I was in a hole <laughs> over there. So, um, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why he never, he never let me forget that I was new is because, you know, he was so gung-ho. I mean, he should have been a Marine sergeant or something. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, that's... We we continued up. We continued operating in that area for another couple of days, and uh, one of the one of the guys found a uh, banana tree, or he thought it was a banana tree. It was probably a plantain, which is similar to a banana, mm -hmm. but not quite the same. And uh, it had a bunch of bananas hanging there, and uh, so my sergeant, Sergeant uh, Oxler. And I think uh, uh, one of the grenadiers, which probably would have been Don Graff, but I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, they were trying to blow this batch of bananas out of the tree with a grenade uh, launcher. Okay, <laughs> and uh, so they told me to go stand uh, back a ways and keep an eye out on the left side, and then another guy was keeping an eye out on the right side. And so they're standing there and they're blowing these, uh, uh, trying to blow this bunch of bananas out of the tree. And uh, the killing radius of the M79 round is only like five meters, that's like 15 feet. And I was probably 40, 45 feet away. And it was an area that was pretty open though. And there were a bunch of trees about this size, you know, about six inches maybe at the most. And, uh, I was standing by one and I heard this noise, it sounded like a bumblebee going by, right after they fired the 79. And, uh, and I said, uh, I realized it had to be shrapnel from this grenade, so I said, hey, you know, you guys, this shrapnel's coming back here, and I'm, Sergeant Oxford said, now you're full of shit, you know, <laughs> you dumb cherry, you know, that kind of thing. And, uh, so they fired again, and, and, uh, I heard it again, and it was just like, you know, a noise like that. And there's no real insect or anything that's going to make a noise like that. And uh, so uh, I said, hey, you guys. And and f f after that, it would, every time they looked at me, you go, they'd go, hey, you guys. <laughs> and, you know. Uh, but anyway, uh, they did it like four or five times, and they couldn't, they couldn't get this thing blown out of the tree. I don't know. So anyway... Uh, uh, Sergeant said, "Well, you know, if you're if you think the shrapnel's coming back there, hide behind a tree." So okay, so there's these trees, they're this size, you know. So okay, I'm standing behind a tree and I'm trying to kind of hunker down. And the next time they fire one of them, hit me right in the shoulder. And uh, fortunately, my I had just a t-shirt on at the time because it was midday and it's hot. So you know how a t-shirt will fold up on the end, it will roll up mm -hmm. like in the fabric. So that's right where it hit. And so it didn't penetrate my skin, but it just stung like a bee. And uh, so that was the first minor shrapnel wound I got. Uh, and I also remember uh, we, we put out a night... Uh, listing uh, post or...? Yeah, listing post, that's what it was. And we had these really crappy radio, handheld radios. They were almost worthless because any mountain that got in the way would cut out the signal and you couldn't really hear. But uh, we actually heard uh, a tiger in, in the jungle. You could hear it roaring. It would you'd go along and, and uh, it, you'd hear it roar and then it'd be real quiet. All the birds and everything would get real quiet, you know. And then all, after a while, they start chattering again, and then you'd hear this rumble. It was really like a low rumble kind of a noise he was making, but we were pretty sure he was coming right down the trail where we were sitting on. Uh, but things like that happened all the time. And I know you've heard about the lizards and the rhea birds and all that, and then every night it was like noise city. and. It's a wonder if we, we didn't get overrun every night because there, there was plenty of noise to hide movement. Uh, so, anyway, I, eventually we ended up back down on that same 
LZ, and they picked us up on March 12th. Mm -hmm. And uh, we flew, uh, I think, kind of like northwest, and then flew back around to the south, and we were coming up on uh, Ripcord. You could see this sort of a bare hill, and uh, you could see uh, mortar rounds or something hitting it, and helicopters going in, and uh, and then, but we didn't go in. We flew around again, and then we went around again and again and again, and we were just doing big circles, race tracks, and uh, had no idea what was going on at the time. And uh, finally, uh, they flew us back to Evans and uh, to refuel because the helicopter was running out of gas. And then uh, we sat there for. 10 minutes while they refueled and we got back on and we flew back out and we did more racetracks. And then finally uh, uh, we went in and uh, I'm pretty sure there were no mortar rounds falling at the time that we went in because I probably would have uh, remembered that vividly but I, I don't so I'm pretty sure they quit firing mortar rounds but they were doing, they had uh, jets flying and uh, cobras were working all the areas where they were taking fire from and uh, anyway we flew in and uh, it was one of the last birds on ripcord and uh, the pilot I think might have been new or or uh, nervous I'm not sure but he, he landed on one skid and the bed of the helicopter was tilted ever so slightly. So the four guys got out on either side and I was in the middle and I was supposed to follow Bobby out the, the right side, but that was uphill. And I could not get momentum to get the rucksack and everything moving. And it was like 10 seconds, the longest 10 seconds of my life and I just couldn't do it. And so I ended up, I rolled out the other side the left side and uh, I stayed flat on the ground because the tail rotors on that side and I didn't want to get chopped up by that so anyway he took off and I looked up and here I am on this bald hill and I looked around 360 degrees and I saw absolutely no one I had no idea where they'd gone and it was uh, the top of ripcord was shaped so that you couldn't see all parts of it unless you were on the tippy top. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was asphalt underneath me, so I knew it had been used before. Uh, so I, like a damn fool, I stood up and started walking up the hill. And uh, pretty soon, uh, Captain Burkhart and a whole bunch of other people started yelling at me to get down. So I finally saw him up by Impact Rock. And uh, I made my way up there and uh, I think the lieutenant was there, but most of the other guys were off on the side. And I just couldn't see them. I didn't know. I had no idea where they'd gone. And uh, so we hung around there for a while. And uh, Lieutenant uh, uh, Davis and uh, Danny Heater had already been killed uh, when they had, they had tried to go down a, a ridge line that ran off to the northwest, I think, and uh, they had been killed by an RPG. And we, uh, we hung around on there while the jets flew and the Cobras worked out in the jungle for, I don't know, maybe a couple hours. And uh, eventually Captain Burkhart decided that uh, he wanted Lieutenant Joliet to take our platoon and go over to the next hill. And uh, so we walked past Impact Rock and down the slope into a ravine that was filled with other big rocks. And there was a trail and we were, we were on the trail and then we went up a real steep hill. And I think it was Hill 1000, but I'm not sure. And we walked up the hill and we got about uh, well, uh, I think the lieutenant was up pretty high, 
So, and I was f pretty far back. So I don't really know how far we went up, but I, I know that it was still real steep where I was. And uh, they, uh, the lieutenant wanted us to get online and assault this position. And this position was uh, kind of a flat area and it was fairly open. And uh, he yelled at the sergeant to get us online. The sergeant yelled at me to pass it on down. So I pass it on down and you know, we were all deep breathing because it was very steep and we were all loaded to bear. And uh, I started to get online and you could hear this noise and it sounded like uh, wind chimes. And they were bombing the hell out of the other side of the mountain and uh, shrapnel from the bombs was hitting the top of the jungle and the pieces were falling down. So of course I'm standing there and a piece of shrapnel hit me right on top of the shoulder and uh, it hurt like I don't know what <laughs> it, it really hurt a lot and I was inst I was instantaneously really pissed off at Sergeant Oxler because I thought he threw a rock at me to get my attention to get mm -hmm. over it you know which might have you know I don't know why I thought that but that's the, the thought that came in my mind and then I started bleeding and I figured out that well it wasn't him and uh, so they called the medic and he came down and, and said, well, it's not really bleeding that bad. And, you know, do you want to be medevaced? And I, and I looked at it and I thought, well, if you put a bandage on it and then my rucksack strap will fit over the bandage and it won't really hurt that bad. And it really didn't. So then the lieutenant decided to change his mind about getting online and we all trooped up to this opening. And uh, the guy who was uh, in the bottom kept thinking that there were people following us up the trail. NVA were following us or were watching us or something. So the lieutenant had us get online and all, we all grabbed a grenade and we threw it off the hill uh, where we were. So in case you know anybody was following us, hopefully they would get blown up. But one guy, uh, his name was John Iardella. He was from Chicago. And he was always different. You know, he was just out there. And he wanted to get an airburst, so he threw his up in the air. <laughs> and we, we all dove for cover because everybody saw him do it. And uh, it exploded about even with where the hill started to drop off. So nobody got hurt, but it was really weird. We all yelled at him. And uh, anyway, we stayed, this was about five o'clock in the afternoon. We stayed in that open area for a while. And then Captain Burkhardt, uh, or higher up, decided that he didn't want to stay in on Ripcord overnight. He didn't want the company to stay in there. So they went in the opposite direction. And we picked up everything. Uh, we had been going to stay there overnight but we picked up everything and we walked back down that trail and back up to ripcord and we were on ripcord then all night on the 12th to 13th okay. and uh that was the night that uh rose got wounded um he was a grenadier and he was on guard duty and uh it was one of those nights where it was fog and it was pea soup thick and uh Lieutenant Joliet thought that he was an NVA soldier walking on top. And he was standing there trying to stay awake because uh, it's very hard to, to stay awake on guard duty when it's that foggy. I don't know, it just kind of, mm -hmm. it just kind of mellows you out, you know. Can't see anything anyway. So uh, uh, he had uh, Charlie Steffler uh, fire a grenade round over there and it, it hit uh, right behind uh, Rose and uh, wounded him in the back and the neck and uh, both shoulders, I think, and perforated his eardrum too. And uh, so he was wounded and we had been in separate areas, but I think we all got together after he got wounded and stayed in one big perimeter. Mm -hmm. And uh, we couldn't get a medevac into him because couldn't see your hand in front of your face. 
And so we stayed on top of Ripcord the night of the 12th to the 13th until the next morning about 9 or 10, maybe 11 o'clock. They got a medevac in and got Rose out. And then we walked down the slope of uh, Ripcord to the southeast, I think, to the ridge line that runs over toward Hill 805. Mm -hmm. And uh, we set up there. Do you have any idea of why you didn't just stay on record and set up the base? I mean, that was well, I think they were concerned because uh, obviously the NVA had the thing zeroed in and you couldn't land a helicopter there. As so they, so you were, were you taking fire then while you were on the hilltop? No, uh, we never did while I was on the hilltop. Mm -hmm. But uh, when the company first flew in, mm -hmm. they were taking a lot of fire and they were taking machine gun fire small arms and mortars all together and the mortars were very accurate so they had it zeroed in they knew where it was and uh, uh, it's very disconcerting when you're firing red tracers out and you f they fire green tracers back at you so uh, it was uh, not a I don't, at the time they felt it just wasn't safe to mm -hmm. set up the fire base I guess I'm, not, I'm assuming that I don't know but basically this is because it's important to have sort of you know what what you see what you don't see what you've got so basically you're as far as you can tell you're just going on there going off going on going off and don't necessarily even know why right uh, although I, I did uh, I know that when I first got there uh, <clears throat> they were um, somebody had was able to see a mortar firing but I don't think the rounds were hitting anywhere near us. But anyway, it was off on the next ridge, probably over on a finger of a ridge running down from Hill 1000. Mm -hmm. And they were in the open enough to where they could see them. And, and uh, I always wondered why they didn't, you know, take a machine gun. And it wasn't that far away. It was mm -hmm. probably, you know, it was outside the effective range of an M60 machine gun, probably. But if you have red tracers and you know you can see where they're going you can adjust fire and you know raise your elevation enough to hit them I would think but anyway they they preferred to use Cobras which was good enough you know mm -hmm. good for me you know so uh, so you made it off your cord you're off yep, another ridge we're line. Off and we're on the next ridge line and uh, we stayed there a day or two we went uh, down the ridge and uh, the captain or lieutenant called in uh, uh, airstrike and uh, Cobra attack all along the ridge ahead of us. And uh, that was, uh, I think, the first time I'd ever really been in. Uh, where the rockets that the Cobras fire were right over the top of your head. And uh, so they kind of break the sound barrier as they go over. And then they hit and they, so it's like two explosions, you know. And the first one scares you and the second one you duck and hope for the best. Uh, we, we went a little farther down and we were uh, building a, an LZ so the, they, Flew a helicopter out and kicked out some dynamite and C4 and TNT and blasting caps and the whole bit. And then these guys rappelled down with chainsaws. And it was uh, it was funny because one of the guys that was operating a chainsaw was named uh, Mickey uh, Clifton, and he was in an Echo Company, and that's what they, that's all he did was make LZs. But he and I had been in advanced training together mm -hmm. in in Alabama, so I knew him. And uh, we had a sort of a homecoming <laughs> out there trying to build this far, uh, landing zone. And we had another guy get wounded because uh, when they, they, they put all this uh, explosives underneath these trees, they would cut big notches in the trees and then stuff it full of mm -hmm. explosives and put a sandbag over the top and uh, then blow it. And it would blow the tree down and uh, so everybody would get way and heck away from it, you know. But one of the guys uh, named Carl, Carl Dykstra, he, uh, they set the explosion and stuff flew over your head and uh, 
and you thought it was done and he stood up and a piece of wood hit him in the chest and he had a sucking chest wound which is very serious mm -hmm. and uh, so we had to the first thing we did was uh, medevac him out on this new LZ we just cut and uh, he went home we never saw him again either uh, but anyway we worked our way out towards 805 and I think uh, we were working our way down that ridge line, and that was when the uh, Echo Company's LERP team got in a firefight, and the lieutenant was killed. And uh, the team got out of the firefight, and they carried this lieutenant's body. Uh, I don't know how far, but they came a long way. And uh, I heard that they had landed on top of Ripcord and gotten off, and then that's when they got hit. I don't know if that's true or not, but it could be. Anyway, they uh, circled around through the jungle and came up, and uh, uh, but they were exhausted from carrying his body and all his equipment. So uh, some of us went down the ridge and helped him carry him up, and that was, uh, I think, the first time I'd seen a dead GI, you know, which was kind of traumatic too and uh, he was I think he was a West Point guy I don't know but uh, I don't know somewhere in there uh, I started complaining about uh, you know I wasn't I wasn't seeing stuff that other guys were seeing and it was it was bothering me that I was gonna screw up really bad and kill, get somebody else killed if I couldn't see. So I asked him to uh, send me to the rear to see the eye doctor. And uh, I had had lazy eye disease as a kid. And uh, so uh, I had, I wore glasses to read and basically that's all I ever wore them for. And uh, I had pretty much, I it wasn't cured of the lazy eye disease, but it was much better. And anyway, then uh, I uh, I went to rear one of the log birds to get my eyes checked. And uh, I got my eyes checked, and lo and behold, I was ready to go back out to the field, and they kept me in the rear because the company was going to be coming in. Mm -hmm. And that's when we were gonna, supposed to go to Eagle Beach. So I pulled a uh, bunker guard from the company a couple days, and... Uh, uh, then the, the company came in and uh, we all went to Eagle Beach and uh, we got kicked out of Eagle Beach because everybody got drunk and, or uh, it was something. But that's when I met, uh, I met Dean Daffler. Uh, then he was a, um, he came in from the Big Red One, I think, First Infantry Division. Mm -hmm. He was, uh, they, the division went home and so short or uh, guys who had a lot of time left, they shipped them to other divisions. So that he got shipped to us, and he taught me how to uh, body surf. And I don't swim even, mm -hmm. so it was kind of interesting. But uh, yeah, I got drunk, and I uh, everybody, got, most everybody got drunk. I slept out on the beach one night, and uh, anyway, they finally they threw us out, and we got back to. Uh, the Curry pad, and we were, uh, everybody was getting equipment together, getting ready to go to the field, back to the field, and uh, the lieutenant was going around, and uh, this is Lieutenant Juliet, and he asked uh, a bunch of people if they could type. And I'd taken typing in high school as a senior because I was going to college and I knew I'd need it. And, uh, but I wasn't very good at all. So, you know, I said, yeah, I, I lied. I said, mm -hmm. sure, I can type, you know. And uh, they wanted somebody to be the OJ company clerk. And uh, the lieutenant asked me, and I, I, to this day, I think he asked me because he was worried that I was gonna walk off the uh, night position again like I'd done before. Mm -hmm. And uh, when, when uh, he had first gotten into the company, uh, they were up on the DMZ somewhere. 
and one of his uh, men had gone out at the perimeter at night to uh, use the john, so to speak, and uh, had come back in and uh, his good friend had killed him. And uh, I think that wore heavy on his mind. I, I don't know this for a fact. I've always wanted to ask him, but he never comes to the reunion, mm -hmm. so I don't know. But I, I, don't know, I always wanted to know why he asked me if, if I could type. And, uh, anyway, he asked uh, more than one guy. I know one other guy, uh, Randy Rogers, and uh, I don't think he wanted, he didn't want to get out of the field. He didn't want to be in the rear. And I understand that idea because uh, immediately after I said yes, I, I thought, well, I don't know if I want to be in the rear or not because nobody had any respect for the people in the rear. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know, I, I I thought about it after a while, and I thought, well, I you know I owe it to my mother because she's back in Missouri saying rosaries every day, and you know, you have an opportunity to maybe uh, be safer. Mm -hmm. You're not safe, but you're safer. So, so uh, at the end of the day, they told me, yeah, okay, you're going to be the new OJT clerk. You're going to learn how to how to do it. So take your ruck and. Report what back does OJT clerk mean? Uh, on the job training. Okay, that kind of clerk. Okay, so you're yeah, just going to learn so the job that way. I had, I had no <laughs> idea uh, what being a company clerk meant, and uh, but uh, I had a good teacher, Sergeant Thomas, and uh, I just went up there and you know sat down and started typing, and typing is uh, very difficult on a Remington manual typewriter, especially one that's been in the jungle and or been in a jungle <laughs> atmosphere for, I mean, I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, yeah, with a old, big old, old manual thing. typewriter. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, you know, you had to bang those keys to get them to hit. And, uh, and like I said, I hadn't typed much since uh, I'd been in college and then been out of college for eight months and hadn't done all that much typing in college anyway. So I was really out of practice, so he, uh, he gave me things to do to uh, practice and, and then he showed me how to do uh, morning reports and stuff like that and how to update SOPs and, and how to uh, post uh, notices on the board for guard duty and KP duty and all that kind of stuff. So were you now going to be at Camp Evans? Yeah, I, and I was back at the company uh, headquarters in Camp Evans. And is that what you would do then for the rest of your tour? Yes. Okay. Now you're talking no. about people not wanting to be back in, in, in the rear, and sometimes you hear stories about all kinds of stuff going on, whether there's racial incidents or drug use or various kinds of other misconduct yeah. and things. And What was the atmosphere actually like at Camp Evans in the time you were back there? Well, um, I'm not a smoker, I've never been a smoker, but uh, you could always get a contact high about 9 o'clock at night if you walk down the, uh, the, there was a front row of barracks where the orderly rooms were, and then there was a back row of barracks, and in between there was a road, and then there was a third row too. If you went back on that third row, or between the third and the second row, or between the second and the first row, you could get a contact high pretty much every night, you know, it was just, I mean, it was in the air. But, uh, and another, um, another time, uh, uh, First Sergeant Ross, who was the company first sergeant, he, uh, he discovered that uh, one of the, uh, uh, that they were snorting cocaine in, in the barracks. And uh, I knew this because I'd seen it at, uh, when I'd first gotten into the company, I'd seen guys doing it, but I didn't know what they were doing. I really had no, mm -hmm. I, no clue, no, no education as far as drug use was concerned. I had nothing. So, you know, a guy showed me this white powder in the little thing and I, had, I, I didn't know what it was. And you want some? No, I don't want, what, what am I going to do? Put it on my feet? You know, I had no mm -hmm. idea what it was. And, uh, so, uh, the first sergeant caught this uh, Vietnamese national, and he was wearing a uh, uh, U.S. Army uh, f uh, field jacket. And there's a zipper that goes around the collar, and then inside is a hood that you put up. 
So inside that zipper compartment, he had all kinds of pills and stuff. And he was going around through the barracks trying to sell. And the first sergeant saw him and watched him for a minute, knew what he was doing. So uh, first sergeant came back into the orderly room and went in his uh, little room that he slept in and came out wearing his 45 caliber pistol and uh, pulled it out, checked to make sure he had a round in the chamber and cocked it and went out there and arrested the guy. So he brought him in and set him down on a chair and he set me down at his office and handed me his pistol and he said, now if that son of a bitch moves, you shoot him. Well, you know, <laughs> I I wasn't mad at anybody, you know, I, I really don't know, I almost shot the guy three or four times because he kept getting up out of that chair and I pick up the pistol and I pointed at him mm -hmm. and act mean as I could, but I really don't think I could have killed him. I really don't think so. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first, I don't know where he went. He went to phone the uh, MPs or, or he took the Jeep up to get the MPs or something, I don't know. But it was like uh, a half hour or so I was guarding this guy and I was scared the whole time. I was much more scared than he was, I'm sure. Uh, but that was, that was a real education. I, uh, as far as other drug use, I, I don't think there was really that much going on. There was, I'm certain there were guys doing it, but you know, uh, not that many. Okay. Now, were there um, racial tensions or divisions, or did the black guys separate themselves? Yeah, uh, we uh, we had this guy named uh, Shelton, and I don't remember his first name. He was a young black man, and and uh, he went to the field. He came in the country and, and went to the field after we were in the mountains. And they gave him one of those rucksacks without, with the inner frame. Mm -hmm. And it liked to kill him. I mean, I felt so sorry for the guy, but I sure as hell wasn't giving him my rucksack. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was constantly complaining and he was an agitator and, uh, you know, he was good in a fight. Uh, or at least that's what people told me. I, I never really saw him in a fight, mm -hmm. so I don't know. But people told me that he was he was pretty badass in a fight. But when you weren't fighting, you know, it was uh, uh, the government was picking on on black soldiers and mm -hmm. stuff. And you know, to some extent, I understood that. Uh, anyway, he uh, he refused. He came into the rear for something, and then he refused to go back into the field. Uh, and they, uh, what they do in a case like that, or what they did in his case, was they put him on the bunker line for a day, and then, you know, brought him out to the, to the thing again. Because they don't, they don't have a helicopter sitting there waiting for this guy to make up his mind, mm -hmm. you know. When they're ready to go, they go. So, uh, and he refused again, and so they uh, put him up for a court-martial. And uh, I had to go to uh, a brigade to testify at his court-martial. And uh, he was convicted and sent to Long Bin Jail, uh, LBJ, as they call it, for s three months or six months or four months or something. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I'll never forget the day he came back. He uh, he came back. He was wearing uh, his hair was real short. He had earrings and uh, uh, makeup on his cheeks, sort of reddish stuff, and lipstick. And the first sergeant saw him, and I thought he was going to have a heart attack. <laughs> I really did. He saw that, and he said, what is that crap on your face? And he told him to go wash up, scrub that crap off, and come back here and get his rucksack and be ready to go to the field. And he said, I'm not going to the field. Send me back to LBJ. And uh, first sergeant got him up to the pad, and... Got him ready to go on the bird, but he wouldn't go, and uh, so they called the MPs and they took him away again, and I never saw him again either. But apparently, uh, I'm guessing that he felt strongly enough about it that uh, uh, he really wasn't gonna wasn't gonna do it, and uh, and he may have had a boyfriend down in LBJ that. 
you know, or, or just felt comfortable in, in that type of mm -hmm. environment. I don't know. I mean, I heard a lot of stories about LBJ, and I don't know if half of them are true, but I know that happened. And uh, I was very shocked, me, a Midwestern, you know, mm -hmm. simpleton, really. Uh, but uh, they had um, a lot of uh, black soldiers gravitated to the mess hall for some reason. They would uh, re-up to get out of the field. They mm -hmm. would uh, re-up to be uh, uh, cooks. And uh, they let them do it, you know, mm -hmm. take a burst of six and you become a cook. And they send you to training in country somewhere and then they come back and, and you see them cooking. Uh, and then uh, some of them would re-up for supply. And uh, we had one or two do that. But they went somewhere else. I don't know where they went. Uh, we did have a, a racial incident involving the motor pool, and uh, I don't know what happened. I uh, really can't say. All I know is that there was gunfire, and uh, the motor pool was not that far from where I slept, so it was kind of bad and uh, frightening. Uh, but uh, whatever it was, kind of blew over, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, uh, a lot of black soldiers uh, were just the best guys in the world. I mean, and sometimes they weren't, but uh, I was friendly with them because, I mean, you have, you have to look after each other because mm -hmm. they're not just trying to kill one, they're trying to kill you all. So uh, you have to look out for each other and uh, so mm -hmm. that's what I yeah. tried to do I don't know and that was what you had done in the field and that maybe sets the pattern for you yeah yeah uh, you know I, I was I had a lot of responsibility for si assigning different jobs in the rear and uh, I tried to balance it out you know I didn't want to stick guys on bunker guard uh, all the time uh, some days you know well in the first place you don't get much sleep on bunker guard mm -hmm. So uh, what, what they kind of expect you to do is guard all night and then work all day. I mean, that's kind of crazy. And then pull guard the next night? I don't think so. Yeah. And, uh, but I tried to balance that out between uh, everybody. All right. So you go back to the rear kind of before most of the ripcord camera right. proper goes on. Right. So how aware were you of what was happening in the field? Are you in constant touch with the, yeah. the company and people yeah. in the field? There, uh, the first sergeant had a desk and my desk was right next to it and in between there was a little table with the uh, company radio on. So we knew all their frequencies and uh, we could hear what was going on all the time. So anytime they had contact and called it in, we knew immediately there was contact. Uh, I think it was approximately April, the April Fool's uh, assault by Bravo Company mm -hmm. happened uh, while, uh, while I was in the rear, and uh, I didn't hear much about that, but on April 15th, uh, my machine gunner Bobby Young and the guy I met who taught me body surf, and Charlie Steffler who was just the nicest guy in the world, uh, all got killed on the same day. And it was, uh, that was about the hardest day. And I felt, sorry. It's okay. And well, there's got to be a certain level of survival, survivor guilt or whatever, because that just could have been you. Yeah, I felt really guilty. And uh, this young guy who would take my place as the assistant gunner, he was, I was naive, but geez, this guy was fresh off the farm. He, he knew nothing. And uh, uh, it was funny because like two weeks later, he re-upped to be a cook, and he ended up being a cook. Mm -hmm. Too, and uh, uh, that was very hard for me to take. Mm -hmm. But uh, the hardest part was uh, the company clerk has to write a letter to the parents from the company commander, and you have to uh, 
you don't want to you don't want to say exactly what happened because that's you know first place I wasn't there so mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what happened and the second place uh, they don't give you enough details to know so basically you you uh, write a letter that says that you know in such a province on such and such a day near this position they were killed and are very sorry and then then you type the captain's name down there and then you sign the captain's name so uh, one of the first things I learned how to do uh, as, as the OJT was signed the captain's name because mm -hmm. Sergeant Thomas couldn't do it and I had to I had to learn how to sign Captain Folletter's name which was really strange because he was gone mm -hmm. but there was still stuff that needed to be filed that had to have his name on it mm -hmm. and uh, so I learned how to do his name first and then I learned how to do Captain Burkhart's name and uh, I signed uh, I did those letters but the worst part about it was you could have no typing errors in mm -hmm. the thing and uh, they had uh, I don't know if you know what carbon manifold paper is that's how you made copies you had to have five copies so you had the original letter and five copies and it all had to be perfect and you know at that point I had been a clerk for three weeks or two weeks you know and my typing was not up to snuff yet and never did get up to snuff by the way but uh, I uh, I had to type those letters and then uh, I had to go get Bobby's stuff together and, and box it up and send it to his parents mm -hmm. and uh, I remember seeing a picture of his girlfriend and, and uh, he had a letter that uh, his girlfriend had written him and I knew that he was not particularly well educated and you know he was a Georgia Forum boy. Mm -hmm. And uh, by the way, if you ever want to get in a fight, you, you want them on your side. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, his girlfriend uh, wrote him a letter, and and I read it. Uh, and uh, I never should have done that because uh, she sounded like she hadn't been through the third grade either. But I, mm -hmm. uh, I, I know she had, but I, she probably wrote it in a hurry or something. But all kinds of grammatical errors in it. And, uh, but, uh, that was really hard to box up his stuff, but, uh, you, uh, you box up all their personal effects and you have to take them up to the post office and mail them off and, uh, get the letters typed and then get them sent, signed and sent off. And I spent a lot of, I spent hours and hours and hours practicing Kevin Burkhardt's signature so that uh, those could go out. And I think Sergeant Thomas ended up typing all the letters because I just couldn't do it mm -hmm. without mistakes. Yeah. Now, of course, eight after that, I mean, Alpha Company, they took losses here and there, but for most yeah. of the campaign, particularly, I guess, toward the end of Burkhardt's run, they had the incident, I guess, of where Wheeler Norris got killed or a couple of right. people got killed. Right. And then you had the command change yeah. in, in the company. That was in June, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We had one more a friend of mine, his name is uh, Bob Lowe. He got killed on May 14th, I think. And I think uh, that was it for until Captain Hawkins came in. Mm -hmm. So they, they had guys get wounded in there, but uh, it was kind of funny because all the people, the sergeants and uh, other people that I had served in the field with were starting to rotate out. Mm -hmm. And because after uh, our unit went up Hamburger Hill in 1969, and so a lot of guys got wounded and stuff in there, and there had been a lot of replacements, and right. they were all starting to rotate through to go home. and. Uh, so, so I saw Sergeant Oxler, Sergeant Lopez, and uh, a bunch of the other guys. Uh, and they'd come to the rear, and, and I'd you know, get to talk to them a little bit, and then they were gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that was about the time that I really lost touch with the guys in the field, you know. Uh, didn't seem like I had as much in common with these new guys. I remember uh, meeting Whelan Norris, but I uh, I never put it together until uh, after the first reunion I went to, they mentioned that, that he was uh, 
Chuck Norris's brother. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. I remember uh, talking to him. He was a real nice guy. I remember. Uh, I think it was him, but I'm not sure. I was I was in the shower, and they used to post these uh, eight inch uh, howitzers or one seven five millimeter howitzers up on the hill. It was about 200 yards or so from our barracks, and uh, they would fire outgoing rounds every once in a while. I was in the shower one night, and these and they started firing, and these new guys, I think Wheeler Norris was one of them, came crawling out of the building. They were actually literally crawling on the ground around the corner, and I just had to laugh because they didn't realize that it was outgoing instead of incoming. And uh, so stuff like that happened all the time, though. And did, what was your impression, or what did you know about the, the, the command change? Because Burkhart gets removed, and Hawkins come in, or did that just happen, and you didn't know why? Yeah, uh, well, no, I, yeah, I didn't know why. Uh, but it happened, and uh, at the same time, we were having difficulties with uh, Sergeant First Class Menzies. And I'm not sure if that happened before that or not, but... He uh, had been, I think it was his second tour or third tour, and he didn't like 101st. He didn't like the way they operated. He didn't like, you know, he was kind of a whiner. Mm -hmm. But for an E7, I mean, you know, what did he expect? And he had been the field first sergeant, but they, uh, they sent him back to the rear because he was more of a disruptive force than anything else. And so he was doing jobs at battalion uh, level, I think. and. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, yeah, Captain Burkhardt is, is leaving, and I, I don't know why. Uh, and uh, Captain Hawkins came in, and uh, I never had, uh, I remember he showed up at the company one day, and uh, we uh, fixed up his room, cleaned up his room a little bit, and because uh, his, his room was in the orderly room in the back. And uh, that uh, that was about the only contact I had with him a couple of hours uh, at the end of a day, and then the next day he went to the field, and, mm -hmm. and we never saw him. But we did have him sign his name to a couple of things, so I could start practicing his name, mm -hmm. and that that kind of teased me a little bit because I was just getting good at Captain Burkhart, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now I had to learn a whole new guy. All right, and then now would you listen into the just the radio traffic so you could hear him, though you're not seeing him, or would you just hear the RTOs? Uh, very uh, seldom I hear him. Uh, mostly I heard. Uh, I'm sure you've heard stories about Lieutenant Kelly. Uh, I I remember distinctly being on guard one night, and uh, Lieutenant Kelly was a different platoon, but they were uh, going around the horn to make sure everybody's okay, and. Uh, Lieutenant Kelly liked to talk on the radio because that kept him awake. And, you know, it's the last thing I wanted to do was talk mm -hmm. on the radio. But when you're on guard and he's talking to you, you pretty much have to or else they think something's wrong. So uh, uh, I talked to him on the radio a couple of times and uh, he came to the rear and he was a fan of me because I used to do, try to do extra things at least at the beginning, for the troops. And uh, one of the things I found was that you could go to the mess hall and get five gallon, not five gallon, uh, two gallon cans or one gallon cans of orange juice. Mm -hmm. And they really liked that in the field. And I remember getting some when I was in the field, and it was great. And uh, so I used to put them in the mail bags. Well, that's verboten. You're not really supposed to do that. But I did it for a long time before I got caught. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, uh, yeah, Lieutenant Kelly was one who really appreciated that. So he got to the rear in early June, I think, and Lieutenant uh, Witches God came on. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Lieutenant Kelly uh, recommended me for the sergeant's exam. Or the, at the time, you could you could get put on the uh, sergeant's roster. And you just rotated up the roster until, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe this month the top 10 would be promoted to sergeant. And next month, maybe the top 12 or 
15, depending on how many they needed, and most of the guys were in the field. But uh, they wanted clerks to have a little bit of rank too, so mm -hmm. that uh, if, when the first sergeant was gone, they'd have somebody in charge. Little did they know that I was the wrong person, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so Lieutenant Kelly, he liked the fact that I had put all that stuff in the mailbags. He really liked it, so he put me in for, uh, he had me put my name on the, or he had my name put on the sergeant's list. So that's how I became a sergeant. I probably would have been a spec four the rest of my tour if, if he hadn't done that. Because immediately after, the month after they, uh, I was promoted to a sergeant in, in July, they started giving uh, sergeants exams. And you had to t Your name had to be on the list and then you had to take an exam. Mm -hmm. And you had to know the cyclic rate of fire of the M60 and you know all yeah. this other kind of military crap. Which is important for guys in the field, but not especially for clerks, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. Anyway. Uh, in, in July, that's when the company finally gets into its really big firefight and they take a lot right. of losses. And did right. you then have to do all the paperwork for all the casualties coming out of yeah, that? Yeah, I did. And uh, that took, uh, there were 14, I think, letters I had to write. And uh, I was better at it by then, but not that good. And uh, it took forever. Mm -hmm. I think I was still writing them uh, around the fifteenth of August or so, and uh, there were there were times when I wouldn't go to bed until eleven, twelve o'clock at night. I'd still be typing. Okay. Did and, things get quieter after that with fewer casualties? And yes. Uh, and uh, guys who got wounded on the twenty second and went away, they started to come back. Uh, Captain Hawkins. Uh, Took the shrapnel through his neck. I don't know if can he show you the scar or have you seen the scar? It right? went went through here and came out here, and he could still breathe. I couldn't believe it. But he uh, he got sewn up and came back to the company almost immediately, and he mm -hmm. was in the rear for about uh, two or three weeks mm -hmm. uh, because not because he was near death or anything, but because he couldn't talk. His voice was. His voice box was injured, and uh, so it just took a while for him to be able to talk. And then as soon as he was able to talk, he went back to the field. Or, I might be wrong, but that might be when they uh, changed him out with uh, Captain uh, uh, Wrightson. All right. No, I, I guess that was much later. Hawkins would have been with him a while longer. Yeah. But, yeah. And now, uh, for you, let's see, now do you get... Do you get time to go anywhere else? Did you get an R&R &R or anything like that? Yeah. Uh, after uh, August, I put in for R&R. &R. I wanted to go to, to Hawaii because uh, I was there for 45 minutes and I really liked it. Mm -hmm. And people were, they spoke English, you know, and everything. But I couldn't get a, they saved all the R&Rs to Hawaii for the married guys and that was understandable. Mm -hmm. And I had been told that Taipei was the place to go because uh, it was cheap and the women were, you know, they charged you, but it wasn't that much. And, you know, and I, I don't know, I decided I wanted to go to Australia if I could. So I, that's what I put in for. I couldn't get R&R uh, &R in September like I wanted, but I got it around the 1st of October. And uh, so I, f I flew from, uh, I flew from uh, Fubai, I guess. I don't honestly remember, mm -hmm. but I think I flew from Fubai to Da Nang, and then from Da Nang to Darwin, Darwin to Sydney. Mm -hmm. And we got to Da Nang, and uh, the next morning we were on on the way to get to the airplane, and it was uh, MPC uh, trading day. You know what that is? Yeah, you should explain it anyway. But yeah. Uh, we, we, they, <clears throat> they didn't pay you with a regular American money because that uh, was a black market item and it could be uh, used to support uh, the Viet Cong and so forth. So they paid you in military payment certificates, which were what we call funny money. And they were little bitty pieces of paper, but they had different denominations from, oh, I think uh, a nickel up to uh, $20 or something like that. And that's what they paid you in, and uh, but every so often they would uh, have an exchange day where you had to take all your MPC and get it exchanged for a new MPC. Well, I was getting ready to go on R&R, &R and 
So I had about 300 bucks. That's about all I could afford. And uh, so uh, I walked, they had to go down to this one place and there was a big fence there and all the South Vietnamese who had NPC in their hands were all trying to get you to trade theirs in. They were trying to shove it through the fence to you so you could trade it in for them. And there were guys who would take their NPC and just trade it in and never see them again, you know. <laughs> but uh, I I didn't know what was going on. And then they, they said, hand in all your NPCs. So I did, and they gave me new NPC. And then you went to the next building, and you hand in the new NPC, and you got greenbacks. Mm -hmm. And then you got on the plane. It was the stupidest thing I've ever seen. But anyway. So how was Australia? Australia was fabulous. Uh, it was like being in America in the 40s only without the war, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, people were really friendly and, uh, oh, I remember sitting in a bar and all the guys were, uh, this, uh, the bar had a, a sidewalk on the outside that went down a hill and there was a window in there and all the guys, uh, all the Australians were sitting at tables underneath the window looking up girls' dresses as they walked <laughs> by. <laughs> I mean, and I'm sure the girls knew that and didn't care, you know, nobody cared. It was very uh, European, I guess, I don't know. Uh, but I uh, I met my uh, uh, another guy from our company that went, uh, Buster Harrison, and uh, he and I were there at the same time. And we did stuff together, we went out and saw the sites together. And uh, uh, what I did a lot was slept. Mm -hmm. It was so nice to sleep and not having guns going off all night long. And I was uh, my hotel was about half a block from the beach. And unfortunately, it was October, so that's like uh, November to them. So or March was, or something. Yeah, yeah, or something like that. Yeah. So it was uh, uh, cool, but there were girls in bikinis out there a couple of times. So it was kind of cool. All right. Um, then you got to go back again. Yeah, I extended my tour in September, 43 days, uh, so I could get an early out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I came back, and when I came back, the guys who had not extended were getting drops of sometimes uh, 30 days. 30 days was kind of the norm, but uh, a lot of them 40, 45 days even. Mm -hmm. They were, instead of being there a whole year, they were like 40 days short of that, they would get to go home. So, because it was a big drawdown, and uh, but I didn't mind. I I had a pretty good job, and uh, and then we started getting uh, incoming uh, occasionally. Uh, there was that one time I talked about it before, and then another time they hit uh, uh, a fuel dump over at one fifty eighth or one fifty ninth Aviation, which was kind of over the next mm -hmm. hill from us. And uh, it burned for quite a while. And, uh, oh, I don't know, there was other stuff going on. Uh, but no no attacks on the perimeter, uh, you know, nothing like that. Okay. So, well, at this point, we have killed off the second take. Oh, my God. Great. You kind of gotten your stories are down to the end of the tour. You extended, so you're getting now into early 1971. By the time you left, do you think, did it seem like the situation in Vietnam was different than it was when you had gotten there? Yeah, uh, I think it was. Uh, it just didn't seem as uh, dangerous as it had been previously. Um, I remember a lot of times during the ripcord build up uh, almost every week you'd see one of the f flying cranes flying back from ripcord with a broken helicopter or mm -hmm. a busted helicopter you know and uh, you, so you got kind of used to it and then uh, uh, again Evans started taking occasional mortar or rocket fire or whatever it was and uh, so they started uh, uh, dropping food gas on Rocket Ridge and you'd see the Chinooks going over with sling loads of barrels and they'd drop them and then they'd throw a, a white phosphorus grenade down and you know the whole hill would start burning and and, uh, and you go yeah well but uh, not so much when I was ready to get ready to leave and uh, 
I was actually thought I'd have to stay at the uh, at the company until the second of of uh, February. It was the way I had it pegged. You know, I wasn't going to let the army screw me out of uh, five months early out by missing it by a day. You know, mm -hmm. so I gave it plenty of time. But the army, in their infinite wisdom, wanted to get rid of rid as many people as they could, so they backed it off a couple of days. So. Uh, I think it was January the 30th, and uh, I was just kind of goofing off, and because uh, I, I had a couple of trainees by then, and uh, I was training them, so to speak, and uh, so I didn't have to do much work, in other words, and uh, I... Uh, I, I woke up that day and the first sergeant said, uh, hey, you know, your orders came through, you got to get going. So, you know, you have to take a copy of your orders and you go around to all the different, uh, you, you go to the aid station, you go to supply, you go to uh, brigade, I think, too, and you have to get them to sign off on your thing so you can leave. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wasn't packed or anything, you know, nothing. And... Uh, um, I had to find my uh, duffel bag. It was right there, but I, it was going you know, to pile a whole bunch of other ones, you know. Uh, so all that stuff, and uh, I cleared uh, battalion, I think, on the 30th and the 31st. They said, well, you know, you can go now. Or, you know, it might have been the same day. I don't know. I did it all in a real big hurry. And... Uh, they, they, I said, well, you know, how do I get to Fubai to get out of here? And, and they said, well, you go up to uh, Brigade, and there'll be a Chinook flying to Fubai at such and such a time, and you can just get on it and go. So I went up to Fubai. I, went up, I mean, I went up to the pad, and uh, it was uh, either January 31st or January 30th. I, I'm not really sure. But as you may know, uh, in February the second, the, the North Vietnamese or the South Vietnamese Army invaded Laos. Mm -hmm. So you're standing there on the pad, and there's no helicopters, and you see all these helicopters going over, and you're all going north. Mm -hmm. and I I mean hundreds and hundreds of them flying north, and uh, there was a an O2 uh, pilot there, a Lieutenant Colonel, Air Force. Uh, uh, bird dog, you know, uh, one of the uh, art, or, uh, jet spotters, they fire the rockets to the jets, so the jets know where to drop their in ordnance. And, uh, and uh, I started talking to him, and then I realized that he was a lieutenant colonel. I go, well, you know, I apologize, and I saluted him. He said, oh, don't worry about it, I don't care. <laughs> mm -hmm. Air Force, I tell you. Anyway, and... Uh, I said, where are all the choppers going? He said, I don't know. Everything's going north. Nothing's going south. And so I went to brigade headquarters and talked to somebody, and they said, yeah, you can't get a chopper today, but you can get on this truck, and it'll take you down. So uh, my last uh, visions of Camp Evans was looking out the back of a truck, you know. Mm -hmm. And I uh, got to Fubai, and uh, it was another hurry up and wait. You have to clear there, too. And uh, they give you uh, all your, uh, they give you a wad of packet with all your orders and, and, uh, and uh, a bag with your medals in it. And, and they tell you, go, go over here to this place and you can sleep tonight and tomorrow you'll leave. So I went over and went to sleep and they woke us up, I think, at uh, 5 o'clock in the morning or something. And I said, yeah, your, your bird's ready, <laughs> so, you know. Got on and then uh, flew to Cameron, and uh, I don't think I was in Cameron more than two or three hours, and I was on a bird. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember everybody cheered when uh, we got wheels up. Uh, and I don't remember the flight home too much. I think we went to Yokohama, and from Yokohama, to Alaska. They often did that. They went to Japan, you usually went to Alaska, yeah. Yeah, and then Alaska to uh, SeaTac. Yeah. And we never got off the plane, I remember that. 
Uh, they especially did not want us to get off in Japan. Uh, I guess there had been incidents. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so we, we got off at SeaTac and they were taking everybody's, they took everybody's picture, uh, every once in a while a flash would go off. So they had a record of who, who was getting off the plane. And uh, we went to Fort Lewis, and they gave us bunks, and we slept for a while, and then we had to clear Fort Lewis, and that was a pain in the ass. But they fed, fed us steak and eggs for breakfast. It was great. And uh, then they, they put us back in the barracks, and, and they said, well, when can we go? When can we go, you know? Uh, and they, they kept telling us, well, there's, there's a screw up with somebody's pay, so you have to wait. Because everybody in your group has to be able to go at mm -hmm. the same time. Well, it turns out it was my pay. <laughs> so, you know, on top of all that crap that I'd already been through, I had to wait another. We were there 23 hours. Usually they're only there about two hours. Yeah. 23 hours. We were uh, back in bed asleep in the middle of the night, and they woke us up and said, okay, you can leave now. And when you left, did they warn you about protesters or say yeah. civilian clothes or anything like that? Yep. Yeah. They, uh, they said, uh, you're still in the Army, you're supposed to wear your uniform. Period. Uh, until you get home. But I know guys were taking them off and uh, wearing civilians. I didn't particularly have any clean civilian clothes, so I just kept mine on. And I flew, uh, I flew to St. Louis and uh, met my older brother. And he gave me a ride to Columbia and went to see a girlfriend. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't, uh, the guy, uh, she was the girlfriend of a guy, uh, the guy that got killed in December mm -hmm. when I was mm -hmm. still in college. And uh, I, I just wanted to see her and she had written me a lot of letters and stuff and, you know, sent me pictures and I appreciated that and I wanted to see her and I thought I might try a relationship with her but it, it didn't pan out. But anyway, uh, I spent some time with her and then got on a bus and I rode the bus to Kansas City and then rode a bus home uh, to a town that was 30 miles or so from my where my parents were living. My parents had moved twice since I was in the Army, so hmm. I had no idea where I was going. But um, this bus stopped at a car dealership in this other town and then my dad came and got me. And we came home, and uh, he pulled the car. He didn't tell my mom where I, where I was, where he was going. Mm -hmm. He pulled the car into the driveway, and I got out and walked around the end of the garage, and there was my mom hanging clothes on the wash. And <laughs> she started crying, and, and uh, right then I knew the power of prayer because I knew she'd been praying every day, mm -hmm. saying rosary after rosary. So now that you're back. Do you go to work, go to school, what do you do? Well, I, uh, I uh, thought I'd probably go back to school on the GI Bill, but I'd been in uh, engineering, and one of, the, one of the reasons I left engineering because uh, I couldn't do the math. Uh, I liked the engineering, but I, it, the math made, the out, or uh, calculus made no sense to me whatsoever. And, uh, so I didn't know what I was going to do, but I, I looked around and I, I looked at different uh, uh, professions and I decided that I wanted to go into forestry. And that was during the time when uh, uh, everybody was going back to Mother Earth, you know, mm -hmm. the hippies were vibrant and, and you know. And so uh, the University of Missouri in Columbia here has a forestry school and it's probably the best one in, uh, in uh, the Midwest. So I, I felt comfortable going there, and, and uh, I looked at the curriculum, and I thought it looked pretty cool. And uh, so I decided to go back to school in forestry, but I, uh, I took a long time to figure that out. I took a couple of jobs. I, uh, I left where my folks were living. I went to live with my brother in uh, south of St. Louis, and I got a job in St. Louis uh, working in a factory, Westinghouse Electric. I made... Uh, electrical switch gear, uh, which is uh, it'll, like enormous light switches, mm -hmm. you know, thousand uh, uh, 
a uh, thousand amps and so forth, you know, instead of using wire, they use uh, plates that are eight inches long and solid copper, or eight inches wide and as long as you want them, for solid mm -hmm. copper. And uh, I did that for about a year and a half, and uh, one day I was looking for a piece of uh, material to put on this uh, thing, and I scratched the back of my neck. And it came out with a piece of metal, which I think came from that time I got hit mm -hmm. on the shoulder. It finally worked its way out, but it, it bled a little bit, and, and I foolishly I threw the piece of metal away. I, I kind of wanted to show my kids that at some point, but I, I didn't keep it. Didn't think about it very much at all, really. So anyway, I, uh, I worked in this plant for about a year and a half, and I met my first wife and uh, started dating pretty seriously in um, about uh, the 1st of August of 1972. Um, I quit my job and, uh, no wait a minute, I got married first. And I, then I quit my job and went back to school. And my wife had a job as a teacher in Columbia and uh, so we were together about four and a half years, but anyway, I finished college and got my degree in forestry and then couldn't find a job because everybody and her brother had a forestry mm -hmm. degree. And, and uh, I ended up moving to, uh, after I got divorced from my wife, I ended up fighting forest fires in uh, Missouri and then uh, I actually, I got to go on a big one in uh, California in 1978. The uh, Hog Ridge Fire in Northern California was about, uh, 250,000 acres. So you could get a job as a firefighter. Yeah, uh, it was, you know, forestry related and mm -hmm. uh, I really enjoyed it, and especially in Missouri because, uh, I don't know, it's, re it's really war rewarding. Uh, they have a lot of arsonists who uh, are mad about the government taking their land or, you know, this and that, and so they, they sometimes set forest fires and they think it takes care of the snakes and the ticks, but it really doesn't. It just ruins the land and the mm -hmm. forest. Anyway, I, I really enjoyed doing it, and I became a crew leader for a couple of years. Uh, and uh, it was very rewarding. I really liked the work. It didn't pay worth a damn, though. So uh, then I, I uh, got a job in St. Louis working for the Missouri Department of Conservation, working on a trail. Um, and. Uh, I did that for a while and then I uh, got a job with the uh, Soil Conservation Service, a federal government agency that hired uh, county employees in St. Louis County and I was a county employee for them. And then I got a job in forestry in Iowa and I had to move to uh, near Dubuque, Iowa. Meanwhile, I, I had divorced from my first wife and we had no children and uh, we split the dog and the cat. and. That was that. Um, you know, I worked in Iowa for 10 years at uh, two or three different jobs, mostly nursery work. Mm -hmm. And uh, learned how to plant trees. I planted probably, uh, oh, upwards of 200,000 trees and shrubs in my time. And then uh, I've uh, grown, I don't know how many millions of seedling trees and shrubs. So you know running nurseries or is that? Yeah, I, I know how, but uh, I ended up working, uh, how did that work, let's see. Uh, nursery I worked at was a big nursery and uh, they got bought out by another nursery in Oklahoma. And the management in Oklahoma was, uh, or felt like the management personnel in uh, Iowa were overpaid, basically. And uh, we were all college, we all had college mm -hmm. degrees in either uh, something like forestry or or nursery or mm -hmm. something, you know. But we were all making uh, about 20, 25,000 a year or something like that. And they thought we were overpaid for, for the work we did. So they fired all of us all on the same day. Uh, and uh, except one guy, and they kept him as a uh, manager. Mm -hmm. they, fired, they fired the manager who hired all of us, mm -hmm. and they 
fired all of us and put this other guy in charge. And uh, so I, I went to work as a spray man for uh, spraying pesticides for another nursery in town, same town. Mm -hmm. And uh, meanwhile, I'd, I'd gotten married and I had kids. My second wife and I had uh, three kids. And uh, so I had to have a job. And eventually I, I found a job in uh, the St. Louis area and we decided to move. I should take that job and then mm -hmm. my wife would finish out the school year and move and we would move to the St. Louis area and she would get another job because she was very employable. She had a master's degree by that time in, in special education mm -hmm. so she was, there wasn't any place she could go that she wouldn't get a job. And uh, I worked as a spray, uh, in a spray out for, for, for Davy Tree Company in St. Louis County for a year and a half and then I uh, I put in an application for a federal government job with USDA Plant Protection and Quarantine. And uh, I didn't hear anything from them for like four months. And then all of a sudden, out of clear blue, they tell mm -hmm. me, uh, well, uh, we'd like to hire you, but you got to talk to this guy. And mm -hmm. so I, I talked to him, and he liked me well enough to, I got the job. I was just absolutely shocked. But I started out as a GS5, and uh, I had to go for training in Maryland for uh, three months. I think, or two months, and uh, I learned all about uh, protecting American agriculture from foreign pests and mm -hmm. and uh, ne'er do wells as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, in two thousand and one, after or uh, yeah, in two thousand and one, they uh, folded uh, immigration, customs, and plant protection and quarantine into one super thing and I became uh, a Customs and Border Protection Officer and I did that for, uh, well, my total federal service was like 22 years. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, how easy or hard was it to adjust to life after Vietnam? Uh, well, at first it was very hard because I kind of just wanted to lay around and sleep and uh, my mom and dad didn't appreciate that too much. so. I had to find I had to find work, and then you know I I had enough money saved from uh, my service to buy a car, and I bought a, a used car, and I uh, kind of wanted to travel around the country and stuff, but I I just couldn't afford it, and uh, my parents were after me to find gainful employment, decide what you're going to do, and you know do it. So that's why I went and uh, moved in with my brother because he was less judgmental. <laughs> And, and besides being around uh, the city, it was much easier to find a job. Mm -hmm. And overall, how do you think your time in the service wound up affecting you, positively or negatively? Oh, I, I have to say it's positive. Uh, overall, uh, there are some negative things. I, I got prostate cancer, and uh, that was not fun. But, you know, after you go through the treatment and uh, go to the doctor every six months, it's it's not too bad. Um, Did they I, link that to Agent Orange or anything like yes, that? Yes, they do. And uh, I received, uh, I received, uh, well, first of all, my, my second wife, after 23 years, decided she couldn't live with me anymore. And she wanted a different life, so she got divorced. And that was bad. Uh, and my wife thinks it's because of Vietnam caused some of the problems that we had. And I'm not sure, I, I'm willing to concede that it might be, but I don't really know. Mm -hmm. I used to have occasional nightmares, and they always were the same sort of thing. I was always being captured as a prisoner. And uh, I don't know, but that was, you know, very first years of our marriage, mm -hmm. and uh, it didn't happen after that. I kind of relaxed finally, I think. Uh, but, uh, but you said it was mostly a positive experience. Right? Yeah, what was good I, that you took out of it? I learned, uh, you know, a long time ago that uh, any day you wake up and you see the sun shining is a good day. I uh, I wake up every morning and everything hurts. My knuckles hurt, my wrists hurt, my shoulders hurt, my hips, knees, ankles, everything hurts. But as long as you're moving, you know, after a while you don't notice it so much. Uh, I learned how to put up with uh, governmental BS, you know. 
you work for the government for long enough and you realize that that the bureaucracy has its good points but it has a lot of bad points too and if you just learn how to play the game and not try to fix everything right away mm -hmm. you can usually fix everything but you have to take your time and figure out the best way to do it and uh, so and uh, I I was able to travel a little bit with the government and uh, you know that was a good experience and I never would have gotten a government job if I hadn't had a been a veteran mm -hmm. the veterans preference helped me get that job mm -hmm. and uh, the Missouri State Employment Service had a veteran uh, a veterans uh, wing or whatever you want to call it uh, but they had a special group that helped veterans write resumes and get government jobs and, and that helped me too but uh, most of all I think it's attitude my attitude is if nobody's shooting at me today it's a good day all right well I tell you it makes for actually a pretty good story so thanks for taking the time to share it today yeah. Well, thank you.